welcome to another episode of Inside Edition to discuss national, regional and international issues in depth. Our main focus today will be the issue of human trafficking and with large-scale international migration influxes. We will be discussing the matter with CEO of Labor Market Regulatory Authority and head of the National Committee for Combating Human Trafficking, Mr. Usama Absi. But first, this report for more. Human trafficking has claimed an estimated 20 million victims worldwide, with more than 800,000 victims enslaved each year. And yet, despite significant anti-trafficking efforts over the past decade, the number of modern-day slaves seems only to be growing, as criminals, networks, mafias and gangs make more than $150 billion a year by exploiting other human beings. According to the International Labour Organization, there are an estimated 21 million victims of modern-day slavery worldwide. Human trafficking is a hidden crime, making it hard to quantify. Anti-trafficking advocates are often faced with the challenge of how to most effectively convey the scope and severity of the problem while putting victim stories into context. The swift movement of trafficked victims and the invisibility of these crimes make it nearly impossible to determine exactly how many slaves there are in the world. The obstacles facing anti-trafficking advocates in 2017 require an international response both to bring traffickers to justice and to shut down the financial incentives that drive this billion-dollar industry. Strengthening law enforcement's training and ability to investigate these crimes can help shut down these exploitative practices among the world's most vulnerable populations. One of the most effective ways to combat trafficking is by educating people to recognize the signs of trafficking and showing them how to report potential incidents. Even in the midst of conflict and violence, collaboration between governments, NGOs and international organizations can combat human trafficking and improve the lives of displaced people. Through these efforts, the global community can make important progress in increasing risks to exploiters to prevent them from enslaving people. Hopefully, advocates and governments will rise to the challenge of 2017 by developing innovative and collaborative approaches to fight modern slavery. Welcome back. With us in the studio is Mr. Osama al -Absi. Thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, we're going to talk about a very big topic, but in order to talk about it in Bahrain or what Bahrain is doing about it, let's first see uh, the current status of modern-day slavery on the international level. Uh, trafficking, being a transnational cross-border crime, thrives on conflict, thrives on economic disparity, you will find that uh, whenever there is a, a, a crisis, a humanitarian crisis, be it war, be it uh, natural disasters or, or anything of the sort, that uh, the traffickers would find it a, a, an opportune situation to do their trade. The uh, problem that we have is that uh, trafficking thrives uh, on two things. First is the economic disparity, mm -hmm. the need for a better life, the so-called migration from south to north. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is the case where they trick the victims mm -hmm. or uh, try to catch them uh, in, in their efforts to uh, cr have a better life. Uh, the other one is in the case of uh, crisis as in wars uh, and, and, and uh, civil conflict in, uh, primarily. Uh, the issue with it is that uh, they present the only solution to some of the people affected by those. Uh, uh, like we saw in the report, the, the uh, attempt to uh, flee to another country, to migrate to another country illegally. Yes. By just being illegal in that country, <coughs> they become vulnerable to trafficking, they become weak, afraid, they can't go to the authorities. And this is what creates the, uh, th the main issue. In recent years, uh, particularly uh, in the last uh, three years, the uh, international focus has been on uh, conflict and its uh, uh, role as a feeder yes. for, for trafficking. There has been many conferences worldwide and there are many papers that were prepared talking about this. And the, of course, the, the, the 
obvious solution is to end the conflict itself so that it wouldn't feed. But as we know, uh, unfortunately, the world goes from one conflict to the other and victims continue to be victimized. Of course. Now, when we talk about human trafficking, there are a lot of uh, examples of human trafficking. It's not only directed into one side. There is those going into um, uh, slave, ba basically going into um, uh, slaves um, as uh, for big um, terrorist organizations like ISIS, like Al Qaeda. And a lot of people don't understand that that these people, some of them, are actually slaves. They're part of the human trafficking. Can you tell us about that? The main two. Uh, facets of uh, trafficking today is sex trade and forced labor. Yes. Now, in, 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 in terrorist organizations, you see those trafficked can be either or both. Yes. But we need to focus a little bit more on, on the, uh, the, the forced labor side mm -hmm. because this is something that some people might fall uh, for without knowing, without knowing that they're doing practices that resemble trafficking. Uh, this exists, of course, in, in all countries that have uh, a significant percentage of migrant workers, uh, and, and some practices may not be uh, clearly understood as, as uh, trafficking, yes. but indeed they are in accordance with the legal definition. Yes, yes. Um, the ongoing refugee crisis, as you said, and also the emerging of uh, terrorist groups are seriously hindering any kinds of efforts uh, of combating human trafficking in different countries. Um, can you tell us more about the particular issue and how um, trafficking by terrorist groups are being dealt with? Well, basically, the, the, uh, the mere existence of, of terrorist groups yes. Uh, is something that should be eradicated regardless of their uh, practices. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have seen recently that they have evolved in their uh, methods of recruiting. They've evolved in their met uh, methods of attracting, attracting people who uh, traditionally wouldn't be trafficked until they reach over there. Social media has played a, a uh, major role mm -hmm. in, in this. Uh, in addition to uh, having some kind of, of uh, disgruntment mm. by these individuals with their societies, um, we have found that these, for example, terrorist groups, uh, traditionally they have their, their markets where they recruit from. Yes. But we've we've recently seen uh, in, in the last few years that they've evolved into Europe, into the States, into Scandinavia, countries that theoretically the citizens shouldn't have a reason to uh, be attracted by them. Yes. However, they managed to do so because they offered uh, uh, some sort of, of an attracting proposition to social outcasts or to people who are uh, incapable of blending in. Understood. And uh, this has baffled most uh, analysts, most uh, uh, social uh, uh, scientists yeah. to try and understand how they managed to do that. So the focus on, uh, and, and, and this is what, what was uh, even said in the report uh, before, the awareness. Mm -hmm that no one is immune to uh, such propaganda and that we need to educate the people uh, of all segments before they become victim to uh, these, these recruiting practices. Yes, yes. Now, before we move on to our next point, it's also important to, to say that um, the victims of human trafficking, a lot of them uh, don't have the power to um, basically fight back, not only because they're afraid or anything, but some of them have mental health issues. Some of them are children um, that have grown up in these, uh, in these um, uh, basically, societies. Some of them were born to trafficking victims, so they oh, that's all that they know. Um, so how is the awareness when it comes to people like that, people that are actually weak because of their mental illness or because of these, because they recruit them. They don't say, okay, no, we don't need this person because he has uh, some kind of a mental illness. This is also someone that they recruit and that will do anything for them because, as you said, mm -hmm. he is removed from society, but he's accepted by this one. The... Um 
the major characteristics of victims of trafficking, regardless whether they are being trafficked for uh, by by terrorists or or by vice yes. rings or or in, in labor mm -hmm. situations, is that they believe society don't care. They believe the authorities don't care, and they believe that they are alone. And this is what they are told. They are told that nobody cares, nobody knows about you, nobody is going to uh, rescue you. Mm. And after a while, they believe it, mm. and they get surprised. We have managed, or we have noticed, even in, in, in Bahrain, when there were cases, that the earlier they seek help, the faster uh, the problem can be solved. Once they settle in and they resolve to the idea that, that this is their life, then it becomes extremely difficult to separate whether it, it is a coerced act or a voluntary act. Yes. Because if, if they're told this is your life and this is what, what, what you're going to be doing and they accept it, then it starts to become voluntary. Yeah. then the, the, the corporal will, will, will get away with it, basically, because you can't prove coercion. Yes. Um, and therefore, it's extremely important that people realize that there are channels for them, that they matter, that what's happening to them is a crime, yes. and that they have rights. Yes. And that will only happen through creating awareness, uh, trying to reach each and every person yeah. individually. Uh, through the media that is uh, more accessible to them. This is where we have a, a, a problem, especially in uh, transnational crime, because we have to talk to people before they leave their country. Yes. We have to talk to them after they reach here. We have to talk to them in their language. And we have to talk to them using a media that they uh, utilize. So if somebody doesn't read newspapers but but is on Facebook yes. all the time or if someone is uh, more radio than television yes. uh, prone. We need to be closer to them. Yeah. We realized, I personally realized in the case, uh, for example, uh, like Bahrain, that having uh, expat civil society, having clubs, uh, associations, uh, uh, groups, Yes. helps a lot because they trust uh, their own mm -hmm. more than us and we can uh, communicate with those either to send info or to receive info. Yes. Uh, it becomes a much more effective mechanism than uh, trying to directly talk to people from 190 countries utilizing 90 languages. It's extremely difficult to broadcast to all of those. But it becomes easy once you have an organized social scene yes. where uh, people from a certain nationality or a certain language within that nationality have their own, whether a formal or informal, uh, social network. Mm -hmm. And that network knows how to reach us. Yes. And we know how to reach that network. That, that method of uh, receiving and uh, broadcasting information becomes much more effective. Using, using these uh, social uh, um, uh, groups or organizations like, um, as you said, the clubs uh, is a way of spreading awareness about uh, what, what you're doing. Um, in the beginning, you said that these people don't know that, uh, that anybody cares, but we know for a fact that you yourself care, and uh, we congratulate you on being awarded with the Bahrain uh, Society for Social Responsibility Award um, for the nonprofit organizations. In this regard, um, can you tell us about the procedures taken by the National Committee to combat human trafficking, to spread the awareness of its role among the Bahraini society? I mean, you mentioned the uh, foreign clubs and so on. But what else do you do to spread the awareness in order to have people who might be facing a problem, um, Stockholm syndrome must, mm -hmm. might still be part of what they're going through, but if they really see they have a problem, what do they do? Um, the National Committee for Combating Trafficking, uh, within its membership, has all the official bodies mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are uh, involved in it, like uh, Ministry of Interior, Public Prosecutor, the Judicial Council, Ministry of uh, Labor and Social Affairs, the Labor Market Regulatory Authority, uh, Ministry of Information, and... Ombudsman. Sorry? The Ombudsman Office? Uh, no, the Ombudsman Office is not there because we have the uh, Ministry of Interior over there. We also have, uh, 
three or four uh, NGOs mm -hmm. uh, available. Each one does its role, but the important element is that we dissect the societies we're targeting. To talk to traffic uh, to trafficked victims or potential trafficking victims is is something that is um, I wouldn't say easy, but it's almost a science. Yes. Uh, it's been done on uh, different uh, in different countries at different levels, and and we can learn from others. The difficult part is to educate society itself. Yes the receiving society, yes. the Bahrainis or the businessmen or, or the people around. You educate them on two levels. You educate the uh, potential first respondents, the people who would come in contact with the victim in the, uh, uh, initially, yes. uh, how to spot a victim, how to handle a victim, and what to do when you're in contact with a victim. That is a science on its own. Mm. Uh, over the last three years, we've done about seven uh, workshops uh, uh, conducted by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, and the International Organization for Migration. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these workshops were uh, designed for a specific group. It can be uh, public security officers, it can be medical uh, staff, it can be uh, uh, labor uh, inspectors and, and, and people who come in contact with laborers. After doing that, we realized that the next step was to uh, issue something called the National Referral Mechanism. Okay. That is a very important document. It's a simple enough document, but it's important to have in every police station, in every ER room, uh, at immigration, mm -hmm. with every inspector, mm -hmm. with NGOs, with churches, with mosques. It is a small document that tells you what to look for yeah. in victims and what to do when you uh, uh, come in contact with a victim. Then it goes to describe the steps, specifically in, in, in time, uh, in chronological order, and in level of importance, mm -hmm. from the first report until the person has concluded the process, be it, uh, uh, depending on, on their wish, uh, return to their country or continue to live and work in Bahrain, and yes. what happens with the crime and what happens with the uh, courts and how we deal with it. That document was only concluded recently and I had the pleasure yesterday of presenting it to uh, His Excellency the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, and we will be launching it within a week, uh, sending it to everyone. It takes uh, a very uh, dedicated effort to combine all the steps that needs to be taken yet make it into an understandable simple document that any uh, person who is not involved heavily in the subject can yes. refer to it, understand what needs to be done. The National Referral Mechanism, who issued uh, officially now in Bahrain, makes us the one of, I think, either the only or, or one of the very few in the region, not just the Gulf, that actually has one. Yes. And it is an international requirement. Now, it's a living document, it's a work in progress, there will be version 2 and version 3 and we will be uh, revising it. You asked about creating awareness. Um, th sometimes you need to send a simple message and sometimes you need to send a very elaborate one. Yes. To the workers, to the expatriates in Bahrain, we need to send a very simple message, which is, we are here. Go to your embassy and they will bring you to us. Go to your church or mosque or place of worship and they will bring you to us. Call our hotline which is 24-7 with eight languages yeah. and uh, we will assist you. Walk in to our 24-7 open uh, facility and we will assist you. We don't need to give more than a, uh, a piece of a simple piece of information that says we're here to help this is how to reach us. Because each one is an individual case. If you start creating an elaborate message, 
people might lose the 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 message and and, and all the details yes. at the same time you <coughs> can't cover all potential cases no cases like the other mm. so the simplest thing is to say here we are that has worked sometimes it worked too well because we receive all kinds of 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 requests sometimes it has nothing to do with trafficking sometimes it's labor sometimes it's even not not even labor even social conflict we started receiving okay. and we're happy to to <coughs> to receive them because the more people get in contact with us the more people r know who we are what we do what's our hotline number you know where to find us mm -hmm. There's a good chance that the, uh, the the some victim will know about us. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we work with is cl closely are the embassies of of the sending countries here in Bahrain, yes. as well as NGOs and official bodies in the uh, sending countries, particularly the countries where we have a repeating case of of, of you know uh, trafficking or yes. potential abuse. That works really well. Um, a, a simple uh, case that was uh, about a year ago. It's so funny how these networks work. It's impressive how they work. A, uh, a girl was tricked into coming into Bahrain. Uh, she was told she's going to get a job mm -hmm. and found herself taken from the airport to, to some shady location. She managed to send a distress message and shared her location from her smartphone with her family back in her country. They contacted an NGO in her country who contacted their headquarters in Denver, Colorado, United States, yeah. who has been in contact with one of my staff previously on a, on a training course. Okay. So they contacted my staff, we contacted the Embassy Ministry of Interior, had a police raid on that location, freed her and 11 other girls. Mm. All of this cycle happened in less than 48 hours. Mm. It went from her country to the United States, to Bahrain, to the relevant authorities, and thank God she was not harmed, she has <coughs> not been taken into that and this is what I meant when I said when we begin before they re, they believe that they are that nobody will help them yes when you initially take them in the other side that we're working on is the receiving society and with the receiving society it's a different message nobody likes to be called a potential criminal yes. you can't tell people easily what you're doing could be a crime mm -hmm. so you need to start easing in it you know what's a crime you'll call it a crime we're not going to you know uh, camouflage that mm -hmm. but the potential uh, practices we need to tell people so what we started with two years ago was uh, I, I, we had a working meeting in, at, at the LMRA and, and I asked my staff what's the best way to talk to the people directly mm -hmm. and we realize that one of the best things we can do is utilize the people themselves we started recruiting people okay. in a different way we launched a competition for 16 to 26 years old mm -hmm. and we asked them to create media a short film uh, poster uh, caricature uh, photo yeah. and regarding a certain subject and then when they submitted it to us and we accepted it then we asked them to broadcast it on social media and then the votes of the people who received it dictated the winners so the first uh, year's message was pay them on time mm. and it's a simple thing the essence of, of, of a labor relationship is wage for effort. Yes. If the person gave the effort, you should give him his wage on time. In reality, not paying people after they've given their uh, effort, effort, after they've worked, okay, is like having slaves. Is like having a, uh, you know, somebody who works for, for nothing. 
Yes. Okay, that's a form of trafficking. But we're not calling it trafficking. We're just calling it pay them on time. The, it was a major success. Our YouTube channel had 750,000 hits. Mm. Uh, we had requests from all over the region to join. We did it initially for Bahrain. The second edition we went, the theme was treat them fairly. Again, simple, benign messages that build on what's happening next. Mm. This time we opened it, the second edition, to GCC. And again, we had some fantastic uh, stuff. And uh, we created a website for it. It's, a, it's a, its own, it's not an official website. But these are the kinds of, of uh, activities that we need to do yes. to uh, not alarm the people, but educate them. Have the message generated by the uh, society delivered to the society by, by the people who created it using social media and not the, the official communication channels that the government usually uses. So we're hopeful. Uh, we're trying new ideas and, and I think uh, we're succeeding. Oh, well, definitely. That's very interesting, especially <coughs> that um, we see uh, Bahrain being a small island country and the people being very close to each other. So it's it's really um, Bahrain's me main media source is word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And so word of mouth plus our uh, television agencies or, or channels, newspapers, everything will help out with that. And as you said, mm -hmm. social media. Social media. And, and exactly what, what, y what you're uh, saying right now, these, these whole uh, being involved in something like that creates mm -hmm. awareness by itself. Um, in performing its duties, the National uh, Committee to Combat uh, Human Trafficking deals with a lot of official institutions. You mentioned mm. some of them, the Interior Ministry. You mentioned also um, uh, the UN. Um, can you tell us more about the cooperation? And how does it contribute positively to achieving the goals that you aspire? Um, the, the trafficking is a crime. Yeah. So as such, the actual act... Uh, is dealt with by the security apparatus as well as the uh, judicial apparatus. That is easy because these two organizations and uh, these two bodies are, are very uh, professional about it and they know what they're doing. Yes. It's what do you do with the victim? It's what do, how do you spot a victim? It's the others like the social workers, the healthcare uh, professionals, mm. etc. What we work towards doing is bringing the awareness to the official level, to the individual level. Yes. So as many people who are working, let's say in immigration or working in uh, labor inspectors or working in hospitals, mm. who their day-to-day -day job may not be uh, specialized in dealing with trafficking victims or, yes. or spotting them. That's number one. Number two, we have a lot of uh, 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 efforts being done in the uh, NGO arena. Yes. And again, these, these people who have dedicated their time and, and, and they've, they've given uh, a lot, they, they don't have many resources uh, and they need to be worked with. They need to be helped. We depend a lot either on dedicated NGOs or the general social network. We need to bring everybody's efforts into place. And uh, you'd be amazed at the, at the kind of people that we cooperate with. Some, some of them are just prominent members of society, mm. of the expat society. Some of them are even celebrities in, in, in their own society. And we use them to, to uh, work uh, towards reaching the people but as well towards understanding the practices. Mm -hmm. they, it's a two-way communication. Yeah. Um, one important thing that you mentioned that's also relevant here before we go to our report is that when you have a trafficking victim, um, you guys also make sure that when they, if they go back home that they are still given the care that they need as victims. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We cooperate with the, with the sending countries. We cooperate with the embassies over here. Um, after... Uh, providing uh, immediate or necessary health care to the victim when they first are, are uh, recognized. And after informing uh, security, 
we immediately inform the embassy. We start working with the embassy. The presence of, a, of somebody from that person's nationality through all stages of the process gives a level of comfort to the victim. Then when, if the victim wants to go back home, because some of them wants to continue living, but if they want to go back home, we liaise with the embassy as well as with some of the receiving uh, countries. We have direct contact with their authorities over there. And we make sure that they are received, protected when they go over there. Some of these trafficking rings have, uh, uh, ha have an extent over there and, and, and uh, they could uh, threaten uh, this victim. Mm. So uh, they are taken. Some countries are, are really good at this. They relocate the victims and they assist them start a new life because what you don't want is them to be falling victim again into the same circle. True. Well, in 2015, the National Committee for Combating Human Trafficking and the Labor Market Regulatory Authority organized the opening ceremony of a shelter for human trafficking victims and expatriates, which is considered the first of its kind in the region. More in this report. The Expatriate Protection Unit in Human Trafficking Shelter Victims is established in line with the directives of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince, Deputy Supreme Commander and First Deputy Prime Minister, Prince Salman bin Hamad Al Khalifa. The facility has been established within six months thanks to the commitment and collaborative efforts of various government bodies. Today is a testimony towards the Kingdom's commitment to eradicating all uh, possible cases that uh, resemble this heinous crime. Today, we not only open a shelter, we open what we hope will keep the shelter empty by assisting the most vulnerable cases in society into sorting out their situations before they are victimized. We do this in cooperation with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, with two civil societies, three hospitals, and five ministries that are represented in this place. As, as I said, a testimony to everyone's commitment towards solving this issue. The dedicated anti-human trafficking center deals with labor issues and further provides victims of trafficking or abuse with a safe temporary shelter, as well as the necessary medical, psychological and social assistance. We know that trafficking is, is often um, a situation in which an individual is, is held in a trapped situation where they're, they're deprived freedom of movement, where they're, they're often held in a room with no windows, where they don't have access to, um, to the identity documents, they're deprived food, they're deprived water. And to walk into a shelter, you feel uh, such as this, you feel that the, the staff have really made a conscientious effort to reintroduce that, that sense of, of well-being and dignity within, within the individual. The move reflects the Kingdoms of Bahrain's humanitarian international commitment towards the labor force which contributes to the economic development and cultural diversity of Bahrain. These messages are very, very positive messages uh, that reflect the commitment of uh, the National Committee on Combating Human Trafficking and, and, and I would have to say the commitment of the government of the Kingdom of Bahrain at large. It was not long ago before even His Majesty the King himself announces uh, uh, um, uh, his commitment and his will to uh, uh, enter into partnership with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime uh, to administer a major criminal justice uh, uh, reform in uh, the law enforcement and criminal justice framework of, uh, uh, of the Kingdom of uh, Bahrain. The shelter maximum capacity reaches 200 and includes an office for the issuance of identity cards, training center, call center and volunteering doctors. Welcome back. The establishment of a center to support uh, and protect expected workers that includes a shelter, which was in 2015 and now we're in 2017, so mm -hmm. it has definitely evolved from a shelter for human trafficking victims, reflects Bahrain's efforts to deal with that issue. Can you tell us more about the initiative and how important it is to us? The presence of a shelter is extremely important. Uh, you may not have uh, a large number of victims. Uh, you may not have uh, the, the, the number that justifies such a, 
a facility. But the presence of a shelter for male and female, the presence of a place where people can go to uh, at any point uh, day and night is very important. What we started with is the idea that we needed a shelter. Mm -hmm. But we also realized that we don't have the critical mass to justify just a shelter. So we took that uh, effort and evolved it into something else. Today over there, we have the uh, expat protection unit. So it protects not just victims of trafficking, but all kinds of uh, abuse. We have the directorate of uh, 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 grievances yes. where uh, the expat could go and uh, file a grievance against a procedure that was taken against him either by his employer or or uh, by uh, the LMRA for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the issuance of the ID cards for the families, uh, the, the dependents who are joining a, a worker and uh, uh, it is done by IGA, by the uh, the, the body that issues the ID cards. Now, the idea is we wanted people to visit that building for very benign uh, reasons. Mm -hmm. They visit it not because they are victims, not because there's a crime, they visit it because they have something they needed to do. What that does is creates familiarity between the, the expat community and the center. Yeah. And they know where it is, they've given it. We have chosen a very prominent building on an intersection of the two major highways in Bahrain where people can see it from any direction. Yes. We needed it. You know, uh, some people create shelters or some countries have shelters that are hidden, yes. unannounced. For us, we, we, we announced it because we wanted people to know where to go to. It's an ER room if they need it but uh, it's also a place where they can have normal uh, uh, transactions being done. Yes. Uh, within it, we have a training facility. We can train about 35, 40 people at any point of time, and we receive schools. We receive uh, school children where we educate them because it's extremely important, particularly the expat uh, children, when they come over there, they are going to take the message back home and take it to their community. Mm. Uh, and it creates, uh, uh, we, we have a uh, presence for uh, Ministry of Social Affairs, we have uh, Ministry of Interior. Right now we're discussing with the Ministry of Justice so that labor uh, <coughs> cases, normal labor disputes, would be filed over there. We need people to know that it exists and they can go to it. At any point of time, that place receives two, three hundred visitors a day. Mm -hmm. So on every day, 300 people come in, you start actually feeling uh, its presence within society. Yes. And, and people know about it, they'll tell their friends if they need to. And it became a beacon and, and that's what we wanted. Yes. We wanted a beacon, we wanted an icon that people know where it is and would go to it. Yes. And uh, in, an, in an institution like that, or basically um, a shelter like that, you mentioned a couple of times protection. And this protection is not only the protection of the rights of the people, but also the physical protection of any victims um, that oh, who's, who's, uh, who there's perpetrators might still be at large or something like that. You guys provide that protection, don't you? Yes, of course. The, uh, there is a procedure for receiving people in distress, yeah. whether they come day and night, uh, we have a step-by-step step what should be done. The place is secured. When people, we even have a panic button with the Ministry of Interior and, and, and you know, people would come very quickly if we need them. I have to say the Ministry of Interior has been fantastic in its cooperation with us. The, the idea is very simple. It's a place where people can go to. Even if we receive somebody in the middle of the night, we have the facility to accommodate this person and initiate the process that is uh, stipulated in the national referral mechanism at that point of time. Okay. People will be informed. Uh, there are people on call. There are um, uh, officials that are on rotation call 
So they could be called at any point of time, day and night. There are officials that are on a shift there yeah. and 24-7 available. Yeah. So they could be called and, you know, and, and brought down. There would be upstairs. They're brought down to deal with the case and, and start the process. Great. Beautiful. Um, as much as possible, people should know uh, about this even more, uh, even if we can on the program put um, the hotline number. Um, but when we move on uh, in the same subject, the National Committee to Combat Human Trafficking places a very high priority um, when it comes to international outreach activity. Can you tell us about that? Um, we realize that, uh, like I said earlier, trafficking is a local crime wherever it is committed that has an international reach. It's yes. a cross border. Mm -hmm. We can't do it on our own. We need the expertise and we need the cooperation of the sending countries. We need the expertise uh, from countries that have a better system than us or have an older system than us. My staff uh, repeatedly go on training courses and we receive uh, trainers. Uh, as a matter of fact, we reached the stage where I have two of my staff are, are now conducting training for other countries. Beautiful. So uh, the, the uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, which you saw in the report, the, uh, the head of their office in the region, he has been fantastic in assisting us. Uh, my staff have attended enough training and trained the trainers that now the UN ODC asks for them to go and train in other uh, countries, particularly that these two are actually uh, ladies over here and in the region. We don't have enough experts uh, in, 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 in the ladies segment. Okay. So in order for them to train other ladies, some, so, you know, uh, our neighboring countries, it's better to have a lady train them. Yes. This has been, I'm, I, I, I was really the first time the United Nations called us to say, would you please send them for a week to train people? I actually began to feel the, the fruit of what we're doing. Mm. We're now from a place that is trying to establish something uh, in uh, 2015 and to us assisting other countries establishing their own systems. Yeah. Similarly, the NRM, the National Referral Mechanism, now uh, after we have it approved, uh, we had it approved, we have uh, international bodies calling us and saying, could you please share your experience with other countries because they don't know how to do it. Moving from a novice to an expert between, I, we started, uh, or I started in 2014, the yeah. end of 2014. Mm -hmm. 2014 to 2017, I think we were doing quite well. Yes. We're still learning. We're still in the beginning. There's still a lot to be done. But I'm very confident that we're moving in the right direction at the right pace. Yes. Uh, Bahrain has always been known uh, for being the first uh, in, in providing um, any kinds of services to help humanity. And it's always been a template uh, for other countries around us, uh, whether in the GCCs or in um, the nearby countries, to do the same. So um, expertise are always asked from Bahrain when it comes to these points. Um, after years of dedicated effort, how do you see the progress of the National Committee to Combat Human Trafficking Performance? I think that uh, in the last two and a half years, we have uh, crossed all the important major boxes that needs to be there, whether physical, like the shelter, or administrative, like the national referral mechanism. What we're working on now is a revised national strategy and action plan. Mm -hmm. Now that we have everybody seeing the uh, results of cooperation. We need to draw a roadmap. We need a national strategy. We already have one, but it needs updating and it needs to, to go uh, with uh, whatever else has been happening in the region, like the conflicts, like uh, yes. other things. And an action plan. The National Committee is blessed with some very good membership. We've got uh, public prosecutors, we've got judges, we've got police officers, we've got NGOs uh, from all disciplines. And everybody wants to do something. But what happens, and, and they're, they're, they're really putting on an effort, but what happens is these uh, fine uh, women and men 
have their day jobs. Yes. They go back and they have their, their full-time responsibilities. We need to put together a revised strategy and then put a, an action plan where each one's role is stipulated in, in clear black and white. Not just to combat trafficking, because combating a crime is a reactionary. Mm -hmm. We need to have a proactive approach, not just reacting to a crime when it happens. We're good at that, mm -hmm. and we've, we've got that out of the way. But to actually work on a dedicated effort uh, to proactively eradicate it means that each one has to uh, play a tune in a big symphony. Yes. And we need to write the note for that symphony. We need to have the strategy and the action plan. We're looking towards concluding this, hopefully uh, by the end of third quarter this year. So by yes. after summer, we should have the uh, strategy and the action plan, and that will uh, be then shared through a, a national effort with everyone, yes. have consensus, and by the beginning of 2018, we'll start working on a new phase. Hopefully. Um, when it comes to, to basically the efforts of uh, the people that are part of the National Committee, and um, it being... Um, uh, it's something that that uh, you don't have a fixed um, uh, time for when it comes to the prominent figures or the, the big people um, that can contribute more. You have also doctors, you also have uh, lawyers and so on. How, how can you change where you have someone that is fully dedicated for this case or for, the, for this issue? Well, we do have the, the unit that we created and it acts as a... Uh, as a coordinator, we will co we will work with uh, the, the the official bodies and officials uh, mm -hmm. as individuals, based on uh, their contribution to an existing cause or an existing case. Okay. Um, if you stipulate, if you specify very simply what is required from an individual. Mm -hmm. Because you have, this is what the national referral mechanism does. Yeah. Step one, two, three, four. You go to a person and you say, I only need you to do this because you're step two. Once this is done, I will take it and to the move step it. three and, mm -hmm. and, and move it on. You will get a lot more uh, response and a, a, a better and a faster response because he knows that this is what he needs to do. If you dump a file on his desk and ask him to deal with it, I mean, people will work with us, will help us, yes. but uh, uh, they might not know how to deal with all aspects of it. Yes. That's the importance of my NRM specialists because they have in their pockets the numbers for each person, how to find them, who's their replacement if they're not available, and they will pick up the phone of any day and night and they will follow a case. And I will have to... Uh, uh, you know, give credit where it's due. Everyone has been cooperating okay. and everyone has been conscientious about, ab ab about this. Once they know that you know, their effort is going to be taken forward to the next stage and the next stage, so it's been very successful. Um, the recent report released by the um, U.S. State Department acknowledges Bahrain's tangible progress in uh, combating the uh, scourge of human trafficking. How do you value this recognition? Um, the U.S. Department of State report um, is an important document. Uh, I have visited uh, them, met with them several times, usually an average of once a year, to uh, try and understand what the, what, how they operate and, and, and what is their criteria and KPIs. Yes. Um, I'm... I value their their uh, input and we work very closely. We take a look at their report and we look for the shortcomings if there are any and we put them in our plan and we address them. But we also have to realize that there are other bodies mm. that have a more detailed approach, such as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, such as the International Organization for Migration. Uh, so we're working with the uh, U.S. Department of State. They have an important report. They have recently elevated the ranking of, of Bahrain. Yes. And we're hoping uh, now we only have one step up 
uh, and, and, and then we'll be in tier one. We're, we're working with them on how, what we need to do to be in tier one. But we also have to realize that there are international standards. They have the U.S. standards, which are an important ones, but uh, there are international standards as well. And we're working with them as well as with the United Nations and the IOM. Yes. Before, um, we're almost at the end of our program, but I'd like to ask you, what are the future plans prepared by the National Committee in order to combat human trafficking and to deal with the challenges of local and international context in that context? We are working, like I said, our, our immediate uh, focus is on the uh, National Strategy and Action Plan. Uh, but we are uh, working on the medium term with the sending countries. Yes. We need to tackle this issue at both ends, not just at the receiving end. And to be honest, most of the countries we, we cooperate with have their own very good uh, programs. They just never thought that the receiving countries would cooperate with them and would seek their assistance. To create a network uh, that covers both ends of the corridor yes. of somebody moving from one country to the other, the process in the middle, the middlemen, the recruiting agents, whether uh, willing or unwilling mm -hmm. criminals, and both ends of this corridor needs to be addressed. We're working with uh, someone like the uh, International Organization for Migration. They have a program for ethical recruitment. We are going to work with them towards uh, certifying recruitment agencies as ethical recruiters. Mm -hmm. And then when these r agencies at both ends have the seal of approval, what will happen is we will promote that workers as well as employers go through them okay. and not through others because they have verified mm. ethical practices. It's all about awareness and it's all about setting standards for every step of the process. If you focus on your own and you forget about the sending countries or forget about the middlemen and just focus on it, you will always be firefighting yes. because the problem will be sent to you and then you have to deal with it. Instead of us dealing with the problem, we'll prevent it by working with these countries. And these countries, their, their main uh, objective is to protect their citizens. My objective is to protect their citizens as well. Yes. So if objectives meet, we can, we can put together plans. I have very good relations with some, mm -hmm. and I want to expand that network of, of relations of sending countries so we can collectively combat this crime. Beautiful. It's, uh, it is truly a humanitarian effort and um, you have created a safe haven for people that don't know where to go. Um, we've come to the end of our show. Is there anything that you'd like to add? I think um, since we're speaking in English and since our audience uh, here so is the uh, primarily the expatriate community, the simplest thing, if you don't know, is to call 995 and say, what's going on? How can you help me? I have this problem. Visit us, we are in North Sehla, uh, and uh, the map is available on our website. Uh, if you are in trouble, go to your embassy. They'll come to us. Yes. Go to a police station, they'll come to us. Come to us directly. Call us, email us, message us. We'll work. If you're in trouble, don't wait. That's my message. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sam al the CEO of the Labor Market Regulatory Authority and head of the National Committee for Combating Human Trafficking for being with us today. And also we would like to thank you for watching and see you next week in another episode of Inside Edition.